Steroids for multiple sclerosis relapses. In this video, I'll explain what corticosteroids are, how they work, different regimens of steroids, and the evidence for them in clinical trials, and of course, side effects. These are the timestamps. If you want to skip ahead, citations below. In general, steroids are hormones that are fat soluble and can easily pass through the cell membrane and change the function of the cell. Corticosteroids are steroids that have anti-inflammatory properties, very different from anabolic steroids like testosterone, though they can have a similar molecular structure. Probably the most commonly used steroid to treat MS relapses historically was solumedrol or methylprednisolone. A typical dose is 1,000 milligrams or one gram given intravenously daily for three to five days, and it's sometimes followed by an oral taper of a lower dose steroid with prednisone. However, prednisone itself can be used to replace solumedrol. It turns out 1,250 milligrams, which is 2550 milligram tablets can be given in place of solumedrol and has similar effects. Also, ACTH, or adrenocorticotrophic hormone, which is actually naturally produced by the pituitary gland and naturally causes the adrenal glands to produce cortisol, a natural corticosteroid, has also been studied in MS relapses. Regardless of whether it's methylprednisolone or prednisone or cortisol, corticosteroids directly pass through the cell membrane, entering the cell and bind to the corticosteroid receptor. This then changes how DNA is expressed. In other words, how it's transcribed into messenger RNA, which is later translated into proteins. It increases certain anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-10. This is something that calms down inflammation. And it can decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, and various other complicated effects that have a net anti-inflammatory effect on the function of immune cells. There's also a a side effect where corticosteroids can bind to the mineralocorticoid receptor, which works through a completely different pathway, which can lead to side effects such as absorption of salt in the kidneys, causing swelling and increased blood pressure. These drugs have a very broad effect on the immune system, affecting various types of white blood cells, including macrophages and lymphocytes, the B and T cells, and even dendritic cells, which cause localized inflammation within the central nervous system. They can induce programmed cell death or apoptosis leading to a reduction in lymphocyte counts if you do blood testing shortly after receiving steroids. Interestingly, even though they're immunosuppressants, they may cause the total white blood cell count to be increased, and the reason is because of their effect on neutrophils not shown in this diagram. Neutrophils are normally sticky and they can stick to the sides of blood vessels, but they can sort of fall off into the blood due to the effect of steroids, causing their counts to be superficial increased even though there aren't actually more neutrophils. So do steroids actually work? They definitely do. This is a meta-analysis of 12 randomized trials. So they combined data from 12 different studies. They looked at different formulations, including corticosteroids or ACTH, which itself is not a corticosteroid, but causes the release of cortisol, which is. There were a total of 1,714 people in the study. 998 had multiple sclerosis and 700 116 just had optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve causing vision loss. Many of the people with MS had other relapses, symptoms such as numbness or weakness of the extremities, double vision, vertigo, imbalance, tremor, that kind of thing. And they found the treatment was effective at 30 days. So they studied the proportion who did not improve, that did not have functional improvement. And the odds ratio was 0.49, meaning you had a 51% lower chance of not improving if you receive the steroid versus placebo. And this was statistically significant. However, at longer follow-up, there was only a 15% reduction, and it was not statistically significant. So the general wisdom is that steroids help you improve faster from an MS relapse, but they don't necessarily change the long-term outcome. Of course, that's the point of disease-modifying therapies. Now, they also looked at future relapses. So you have optic neuritis now 
now, but you could get inflammation of the spine later. And there was a trend towards reduction in future attacks, a 26% reduction odds ratio of 0.74, but it was not quite statistically significant. You can see the confidence interval does overlap 1.54 to 1. 01, just barely, not statistically significant. And most people think that steroids aren't that effective in the long run, probably would not prevent an attack many months later, as their effect on the cell is quite brief, perhaps lasting only a few weeks. This is the famous optic neuritis treatment trial where people with optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve, causing pain and vision loss, usually in one eye at a time in multiple sclerosis, were randomized to get high dose IV steroids, solumedrol, lower dose oral prednisone, or placebo. There were a total of 457 people in the study, and they gave IV solumedrol 250 milligrams every six hours. So that's a total of 1,000 milligrams in a day. We just don't do it like this anymore because giving solumedrol later in the day can cause very severe insomnia, and it's not more effective. This was versus a lower dose of prednisone, one milligram per kilogram, and this is a fairly low dose. If you weigh 80 kilograms, this would be 80 milligrams. Remember, you need 1,250 milligrams of prednisone to equal one gram of solumedrol, and this was over 14 days versus placebo. And this is the result in terms of the proportion who had a normal visual field exam, so higher would be better. People getting the IV solumedrol did the best, and people getting lower dose steroid and placebo did about the same. It's thought that lower doses of steroid don't really get into the central nervous system. There's poor penetration through the blood-brain barrier, which is why you need higher doses, whereas 80 milligrams would be a very high dose if you're trying to treat something like asthma or poison ivy. Now, it also seemed that there weren't huge differences after 180 days, but people getting IV solumedrol got better faster, as mentioned previously. In terms of visual acuity, how well you can read an eye chart, IV solumedrol was a little bit better, the solid line, but by the end of the study, there weren't huge differences. Another thing they looked at is the proportion who got optic neuritis later on, or another event consistent with an MS relapse. And they followed them for 720 days, or about two years, and people getting IV solumedrol and placebo did about the same, but people getting the lower dose prednisone did much worse. In other words, significantly more of people getting prednisone developed recurrent optic neuritis or multiple sclerosis. Hard to believe that prednisone could increase your chances of getting an inflammatory event a year later, but it's hard to argue with the data. This was statistically significant. I think it's a bit of a flukish result, my personal opinion, but generally lower dose prednisone is not recommended for MS relapses. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday, and you can also check out my book, Resilient in the face of multiple sclerosis about incredible people who live amazing lives despite having MS completely free on Amazon. And please talk to your own personal medical provider for medical advice. So do you really need IV methylprednisolone? Can you just take a pill instead? Well, according to this randomized trial, the answer is yes. After all, steroids have virtually 100% bioavailability. In other words, if you swallow the pill, it's going into your bloodstream almost entirely anyway, so it should be equally effective. This was a small randomized trial comparing IV methylprednisolone to an equivalent oral dose. Now, you can't really do this because the tablets of oral methylprednisolone, the dose is too low. You would have to take a ridiculous amount of it, but it's a good proof of concept study. They looked at 42 people with an MS relapse, and they found that there were similar outcomes. The EDSS, Expanded Disability Status Scale, a measure of disability in MS research, a 1 to 10 excuse me, a 0 to 10 scale was only 0 0.07 lower in people getting IV steroids, obviously not statistically significant. They did about the same. The tablets were just as good. This is a more recent trial published in JAMA. They randomized people with optic neuritis to either solumedrol 1 gram IV daily for three days or prednisone 1,250 milligrams. That's 25 50 milligram tablets, so you have to take them slowly with a glass of water over breakfast, and they could irritate your esophagus if you're not good at swallowing pills. 
daily for three days and the results were equal. I'm showing the results of visual evoke potentials. This is an electrophysiologic test where we see how long it takes information to get from your eye to your occipital lobe, indicating damage to the optic nerve if the length of that time is prolonged. But they also looked at visual acuity, the eye chart, or something called low contrast letter acuity, which is sort of a faded eye chart, very sensitive to optic neuritis, and they were all equal. Oral steroids are just as good. It's a completely legitimate option. Okay, so what about ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone? Well, this is a naturally occurring hormone that causes the adrenal glands to release cortisol. It can't be patented, so it's hard for a drug company to dominate the market and make money off of it, but it was historically used to treat MS relapses. Interestingly, the drug has become more expensive over time because it's used to treat a rare epilepsy syndrome called infantile spasms, and there are relatively few people with that condition, so the drug company who manufactures it wanted it to be more expensive so they could make money on the product and market it effectively, so it's prodigiously more expensive than it used to be when it was originally developed. And of course, now that people are considering it for inflammatory diseases, it becomes somewhat cost prohibitive. This is one of the older studies on ACTH from 1989, a randomized trial of ACTH versus solumedrol for MS relapses. There were 61 people and there was no difference in recovery, hence people lost interest in this treatment. However, many years later, it was found that ACTH had has some effects on certain white blood cells that are not mediated by cortisol, so it could be worth studying in inflammatory diseases yet again. This is a more recent study with many authors I recognize. First author, Dr. Regina Berkovich, one of my former fellowship mentors at USC, along with Dr. Liliana Amescua, who got cut off here, unfortunately, and Lauren Steinman, my mentor's mentor, who I interviewed previously on this channel about a potential multiple sclerosis vaccine, to the video on that in the description below. This was a single blind randomized trial. In other words, the examiner was blind, but the person with MS was unblinded. So that could introduce a bias. And this was kind of used as a disease modifying therapy, not as a treatment of relapses. These are people with relapsing MS already on a disease modifying therapy, interferon beta. So this was an add-on study, but they had to have active disease with a relapse or new MRI lesion within the past year. And if you consider this was prior to the widespread use of highly aggressive disease modifying therapies in the majority of people with MS at multidisciplinary clinics, it was published in 2016, but you have to consider the actual study took place a little bit before that. They had at least moderate disability EDSS of three to up to 6.5 requiring a walker to walk. There were only 23 people in the study, very small, and they were randomized to getting ACTH 80 units once a month intramuscularly or three days of IV solumedrol. So solumedrol one gram, three days in a row, repeating that every month for a year. So this isn't necessarily a practical long-term option as this amount of steroids could cause significant side effects. Nonetheless, in this study, ACTH fared much better. This is looking at the cumulative incidence of relapses. You can see the blue line, very few getting ACTH had relapses, whereas people getting intravenous methylprednisolone by the end of the study, it was well over 50%. And I previously noted this drug probably doesn't prevent future relapses very well. And so it shows that ACTH is doing something here, but looking at other outcomes like EDSS, a measure of disability, the MS functional composite, MS quality of life scales, and even MRI activity, they were both the same. So it's not 100% clear that ACTH is superior. Finally, I want to talk about the side effects. Now, these drugs are given for short periods, hopefully limiting severe side effects. These are all immunosuppressive suppressants and can cause infections, and they have various other well-known side effects. They can cause the liver to synthesize glucose, raising blood sugar, even causing diabetes temporarily. They can cause you to retain salt and also increase the contractility of the heart, raising blood pressure, sometimes to very high and dangerous levels. 
They can cause mood changes, irritability, insomnia. It's preferred to take them in the morning with breakfast and let the effects wear off during the day. However, some people have positive mood effects, feeling energetic and good. Now, it can sometimes cause serious psychiatric disturbances like mania or even psychosis. Some people simply cannot take steroids. The side effects are too severe. They're harsh on the stomach, whether or not you take them IV or orally, and they can cause stomach ulcers or gastritis inflammation of the stomach. Typically for doses of prednisone 10 milligrams and higher, gastrointestinal protection with acid blockers such as Prilosec are recommended. Also, they cause weight gain in two ways. One, they cause the kidneys to retain salt and water. They also make you hungrier, so you simply eat more food and gain weight, though for a short course of steroids, you're probably going to lose it back over a few weeks. They're really bad for the bones long term. They can cause bone thinning, osteoporosis, and they can cause a specific side effect where they can damage the blood vessels that go to the proximal hip, the femur bone, and cause something called avascular necrosis, which can cause permanent damage to the hip joint in some cases. They also affect the fibroblasts that produce connective tissue within the skin, and with long-term use, they can cause cause atrophy of the skin, which can be very serious. So please share in the comments below, particularly if you've ever taken any of these regimens. Did you think oral steroids were just as effective as IV? And have you ever tried ACTH? And did you have any side effects from any of these treatments? Let me know if you have any questions or ideas for future videos.